Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, April 18th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Last week, reports surfaced of international domain names being used in phishing attacks. While this is in itself nothing new, it does look like this latest attempt was more widespread and hit some large domains like apple.com as well as some financial domains. Also, the attacker in this case apparently went through the trouble to get an SL certificate via Let's Encrypt. The trick, of course, is pretty simple. The attacker registers a domain that uses international characters that look very close to specific English characters. A user clicking on a link has no idea that they're being sent to a very different domain than the one that appears to show up in the link or the browser's URL bar. In October 2015, I actually did some experiments with this and the success of this attack depends a lot on the browser the victim is using. Some browsers, like for example Internet Explorer, will for the most part not render international characters if a domain mixes different languages. This sounds actually like a rather reasonable and effective approach. Other browsers like Firefox use a whitelist approach and will only render international domain names for some top level domains. .com is for example not on the list, while .org and country level domains are on the whitelist. Safari on the other hand appears to have no problem rendering most international domains. If a browser does not render the international characters, then it will fall back to Punicode, which is obviously different from the English characters and a domain could not easily be impersonated if the browser displays Punicode. Remco Verhoef expanded on this issue a bit in today's diary. He is listing some of the common homographs or lookalike letters used in the recent attacks. He also wrote a tool to automatically find domains that use any of these specific letters. This approach could help with a somewhat more fine-grained approach to filtering these domains. Now back at the end of 2015, most Linux distributions quietly patched a serious vulnerability that was now made public. The vulnerability allowed a remote attacker to execute arbitrary code with a single UDP packet and that code was executed with kernel privileges. That's right, all it took was any UDP listener on the system and since the problem was with the Linux kernel, it didn't depend on the particular software that listened for incoming UDP packets. All the software had to do was to use the standard receive function and to accept UDP data while setting the message peak flag. And that is done by many pieces of software. So for example, Nginx, WGET are some of the examples that were listed as vulnerable or at least exposing the vulnerability. Again, it wasn't the software that was vulnerable, it was the library, the API call they called in the kernel. Luckily, this vulnerability is considered somewhat difficult to exploit and as far as I can tell, no specific exploit is publicly available for it. It should be a good reminder to not overlook these kernel updates and to, of course, reboot your machine from time to time to make sure the updates are applied. The particular vulnerability became noticed only now because Google included it in the latest Android update and it had a fairly old CVE number, a 2016 CV number, which I guess is why it stuck out somewhat. An interesting vulnerability was made public in Microsoft Edge. That particular vulnerability has not been patched yet and it could potentially be used to unmask a user's identity. The trick is pretty simple. An attacker would use the JavaScript fetch function to request a URL. 
fetch a modern replacement for XML HTTP request, place a similar role as XML HTTP request and place by similar rules. Unless a page explicitly allows cross-origin requests, a request to a site that is not the same as the origin from which the particular JavaScript was loaded will return an empty response. Apparently, there are some different definitions of what an empty the response means. Sadly for Microsoft Edge, this means the headers will still be passed back to JavaScript. So what an attacker could do with this is an attacker could, for example, send a request to facebook.com slash me. Facebook, in response, will return a redirect. The URL for the redirect, which will be included in the headers, the location header, will list the user's user ID with Facebook. The JavaScript that sent the message will now receive the actual user's user ID as part of the response. So in order to figure out who a particular user is, the attacker just has to send a fetch request to a site that the user is likely logged in at, and then the username is being returned as part of the URL. Of course, depends on finding the right site to use here as well, but of course, Facebook would make already a pretty lucrative example. And again, the problem here isn't really Facebook, it's that Microsoft Edge isn't filtering the response. A proof of concept exploit was made public for this issue and a test site configured by the discoverer of the vulnerability can be used to test your browser. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. And by the way, we have a webcast coming on Friday, just to give you some advance notice Friday. I believe it's 1 p.m. Eastern about issues and threats to NoSQL databases. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.